all give this guy a round of applause because Andrew Work is the best MC in Asia. I'm so glad to be here. Today, I will try to convince you that cryptocurrency and blockchain will have the most impact on financial services. Let me first tell you a little bit about NextChange, a little plug. We are an innovation platform for fintech, insuretech, AI, blockchain, smart cities, and health tech. And with that ecosystem, we either create, we either market, or we invest in innovative products. I would like to take this time to just do a little poll. Everybody has to participate. So what percent of the banks are actually investing in blockchain for 2018? A raise of hand for 33%, okay, 52%, more, and 91%. Well, it's actually quite similar. Okay, so the answer is actually 91%, and in 2017, or the uh, actual production that's going to be taking place is 14%. So financial institutions... And financial services is where most of blockchain is actually going to be implemented. The financial service disruption evolution is coming in many ways. Everybody's familiar with fintech. This is about robo-advisory. It's about chatbots. It's about very fancy apps that you have in front of you. But what really is going to be the profound impact is going to be blockchain. Financial service projects are being focused on cost cutting and efficiency gains. And financial institutions are working actively with startups to develop private blockchain projects because they want control and they also want to be participating in this new technology. Just give you some reference of size. I mean, I'm, everybody knows that the crypto world is, still has a lot more room to grow, but it's actually less than the size of JP Morgan. And if you look at Ethereum, it's actually about the size of Morgan Stanley. So there's a lot more room to grow here. So one of the things we wanted to do was to look at the actual development of blockchain and financial services. And what we had to do was we actually looked at what's happening with the programmers and actual projects. So when you go on GitHub, where all of these projects largely reside, most of the activity is taking place in San Francisco and London. And in San Francisco, most of those are projects with exchanges, wallets, interfaces with blockchain, payment tools for cryptocurrency, in London, it's been largely focused on Ethereum, which will be identity management, and also with smart contracts, open APIs. We also see in New York a lot of focus on financial services. And in China, especially in Shanghai, and also in Beijing, our, the focus there has been on cryptocurrency and exchanges, but really the scaling of them. But there are many hurdles with blockchain. What you'll see from this graph is that when you ask financial institutions today, they're most concerned about scalability. Can this project scale? Just because when you look out there, you really don't see large scale projects. You don't see a lot of data. They're concerned about this. They're concerned about the industry standards. They're also concerned because most of these financial institutions, if you have ever worked with them, have tremendous amount of legacy systems. And if you have ever actually communicated with them, it's, been, it's very hard to integrate. So the interoperability everybody talks about amongst different blockchain, well, that's nothing compared to the interoperability with the legacy systems. Of course, security is very important. So today, um, I would like to share with you six major themes behind the decentralization of financial services. Let me start with financial inclusion. This is a $380 billion industry. And you can kind of divide it into two points. 
It is literally closing the gap for small business, which is the credit gap. And then the other part is bringing those who are not, that are unbanked into the financial system and actually elevating their spending. This is a very large opportunity, especially in the emerging markets. And we see the emerging market is a, obviously one of the areas where financial inclusion is taking place because they have high mobile penetration, low banking penetration, and the infrastructure is much less developed, and what we're seeing is incumbents actually exiting the market. So what does blockchain do? Well, you won't have to have actually a retail outlet, no branches. Digital, digital payments can be taking place. Low cost and fees. So all of these things are going to be possible, but I think the thing that's most interesting is that if you have a mobile phone, you want instant settlement. So this is important. And payments is one of the most important parts of this financial inclusion story, which is basically why we're seeing that this is the $600 billion industry with $40 billion in fees. Everybody knows that Western Union MoneyGram has built a large infrastructure over the last decades. And what we're seeing is that fees can range anywhere from 2% to 7%. And a wire transfer can be as high as 15%. So this is an amazing place to disrupt, especially in the cross-border payments. Because individual consumers, SMEs, face very high transaction costs, long delays, and really, what we see is an uncertainty in this cross-border payment. Blockchain will reduce the processing time from, this says, days to weeks, but it's weeks to days. And from minutes to seconds, smart contracts will actually contain the remittance information that will, will allow and deliver the funds directly to the beneficiary's bank, simultaneously saying, sending it to the regulator. So this will create new business models and different ways of actually regulating. So, there's going to be a number of startups. I won't go into all the details, but there will be crypto-based global payments companies. Large banks are currently in the process of testing various different applications in the consortias. And of course, Ripple has created a global financial settlement solution and that is being now, being uh, uh, they have 75 plus banks involved in that uh, uh, project. Trade finance is the lifeline of global trade. This is a industry that if you look at the financing gap, it's about 1.6 trillion. This is a very important aspect of the emerging markets. The supply chain is cumbersome, it's time consuming, and multiple platforms, multiple checkpoints delay the whole process. You have potential for fraud. So this is a, an industry also very ripe to be uh, implemented with blockchain because blockchain will provide and introduce transparency, traceability, and immutability. This is a project that is being, uh, that's already in, pr in place, eight major European banks have come together and created a permission-based trade finance platform. You can access this on your mobile app. Available uh, and simplifies the whole process of managing, tracking, and securing domestic and international trade, trade transactions. This is gonna be available in the second quarter of this year. I come from the asset management industry and I can tell you how difficult it is to deploy new technology. Asset managers are really just beginning to see the, and exploring blockchain and its applications. The buy side has always been trailing the sale side in terms of implementing the technology because they expected the sell side to implement it first. But the revenues have dramatically changed because sell side has shrunk dramatically. Now the revenue on the buy side compared to the sell side is that they're three times larger. So the buy side has to now be much more proactive in terms of the, the development of technology. But in this industry, this industry is filled with a lot of partners because it's very much outsourced. And 
you have to get cooperation from the partners and many market players to execute different types of strategies. Just a few of the problems we see, of course, the onerous KYC and AML onboarding process. This take, costs a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. We also see from a portfolio management standpoint, as a, a money manager myself, I experience the same thing where you have a model portfolio, you're trying to uh, uh, you know, distribute across a number of clients. It's a time-consuming process because there's a number of different platforms and it's not that easy to do. Well, blockchain can solve many of these points because with a distributed ledger, portfolio managers can actually communicate portfolio changes and the, and the clients and, uh, are enabled to see all the changes quite quickly. Yesterday we talked about, uh, uh, or the, uh, uh, there was a panel on decentralized exchanges. And with the decentralized exchanges, basically you are, basically it's a peer-to-peer -peer environment where you can trade amongst yourselves. We see that in this process there's very, there's almost no personal information that needs to be shared and there's no central server, but the downside is somewhat complex, and also what we see is that it doesn't have a tremendous amount of liquidity. And finally, I'd like to leave you with this kind of perspective. Can cryptocurrency become the fiat currency? In Canada, the Bank of Canada is already looking at this. They've already developed a white paper. They are looking at the merits. They're one of the largest, I guess, most developed countries that's looking at this. Estonia has already created, or planning to create its own uh, cryptocurrency, but it will be in token form, not as a currency. Marshall Island is the first country in the world that actually has recognized cryptocurrency and has created a digital form of this called SOV. And Venezuela has launched a new cryptocurrency in light of the various different difficulties they've had in the economy based on hyperinflation. So in the future, we believe that in 2018 or 2019, these uh, large countries are exploring the potential for cryptocurrency as a fiat currency. I think it's all possible, not because of economic problems, but it would be based on accessibility, ease of use, much cheaper to implement. So in, in summary, what I'd like to say is that blockchain will be transformative. Most financial institutions will be in some way implementing blockchain solutions and that we, will, we are a major beneficiary of financial inclusion. But I want to be clear that the most important thing, I think, with blockchain implementation is that we need to find real pain points, not fabricate problems that we want to solve. So I'd like to leave you with my final last quote from Abraham Lincoln, which said, I can't wait for the future, but it just comes one day at a time. Thank you very much.